<laughs> Margot, thank you so much for that beautiful introduction and um, no pressure. <laughs> um, okay, so today I'm gonna be talking about joy, but rather than just talk about it, I thought we would start with a little experience of it. So um, I know that some of you have laptops on your lap. I'm gonna ask you to put those aside and stand up with me for a second. Okay. Okay, and what I want you to do is to find your own unique happy dance. <laughs> so, um, this is not your, you know, your choreographed moves from um, eighth grade or your bar mitzvah. This is not anything fancy. I'm not going to make anyone come up here and do this with me. We're just going to do this on our own together. Um, but really what a happy dance is, is just an expression of the joy that you feel in this moment. Um, and it wouldn't be fair for me to ask you to do this without giving you a little bit of inspiration. So um, here are some ideas uh, to get you going in case you don't have a happy dance at the ready, and this isn't something that you do every day. Um, you can you know, get the upper body into it like Brad Pitt. You can sort of do this like whole wiggly thing like Bill Nye. If you want to go the Batman and Robin direction, I would just suggest you step out into the aisle um, and make a little bit more space. Um, so take a second, just think about maybe what you want to do, or you can just wing it and see what happens. Um, but uh, are you ready? Okay. Okay. So let's do this. We're going to do this for about a minute, and then that's it. Okay? <laughs> All right. Oh! Okay, we lost the music. We're going to try that again with the music. Okay. It might seem crazy. someone who wouldn't even dance in a middle school dance. So <laughs> thank you for doing that with me. OK, so why did I have you do that? In addition to it being the end of the day, and I'm sure you've been sitting for a little while, I do have a good reason. And the reason is this. I think, as a society, we are obsessed with the pursuit of happiness. And in the process, we overlook these little moments of joy. And we often use those words interchangeably in our culture, happiness and joy. But in fact, they're different things. Let me catch my breath from the happiness. <laughs> um, happiness is a broad evaluation of how we feel about our lives over time. So if I were to ask you right now, on a scale of 1 to 10, how happy are you? You probably don't just like put a finger in the air and go, I'm a 7, right? Um, you have to think about it. You have to think about how you feel about your work. What are the quality of your relationships? How do you feel about your health? Do you feel like you have a sense of meaning and purpose in your life? But joy is much simpler and more immediate. The way that psychologists define joy is as an intense, momentary experience of positive emotion. We can measure it through direct physical expressions, things like smiling and laughter and a feeling of wanting to jump up and down. That feeling of wanting to jump up and down is actually a technical thing. It's one of the ways that scientists measure joy in the lab. So while happiness measures how good we feel over time, joy is about how good we feel right now, in the moment. And I think that's what makes it easy to overlook. But it's a shame that we overlook it, because small moments of joy actually have surprisingly big effects. So I want to talk about a few of these. So first of all, Joy is an inherently attractive emotion. Joy is contagious. All of our emotions are contagious. We spread them to each other through our tone of voice, our facial expressions, our gestures. And you may have found this during the happy dance, right? If someone near you was dancing um, really 
uh, with big gestures, you catch that. That's contagious. Um, and so because of this, we want to catch joy. So we're attracted to people who exhibit it. And this can actually make us more physically attractive. So scientists have done studies. They take these computer-generated faces, faces that are, they've generated to be average looking, which they make smiling, and faces that are supposed to be like really, really good looking, that are not smiling. And what they find is that the genuinely joyful faces are considered more physically attractive than the supposedly really, really good-looking stony-faced model faces. Um, so when we exhibit joy, it makes us seem more physically attractive to other people. And this can actually have business implications. So salespeople, when salespeople exhibit genuine joy, and it can't be fake, it has to be real, we spend more time browsing in a store, we are more likely to give higher customer satisfaction ratings, and we're more likely to return for a repeat visit. Joy also sharpens our minds. So when business people make decisions, um, research shows that when they're in a state of joy, they make better decisions than when they're in a neutral mindset. That joyful leaders have more engaged teams and that their teams act in a more coordinated way and produce results with less effort in the process. Um, some research actually shows that we're up to 12% more productive in a state of joy. And so I think while we often think of joy as a distraction from our success, in fact, it can be a catalyst for our success. Joy also opens us up to new ideas. I think this one is really important for you all as marketers, um, thinking about how we get people to try new things um, and take risks on something that they don't know already, that's maybe a little out of their comfort zone. So one of the theories behind the evolution of positive emotion is called broaden and build. And the idea behind broaden and build is that our negative emotions evolve to narrow our focus, to help us deal with immediate threats and challenges. So if you wake up in the middle of the night because you heard a, a noise, you're not thinking about what you're going to have for breakfast, you're not planning your next vacation, you're thinking only about what that noise is and what you're going to do about it. So negative emotions like fear, like anger, those emotions narrow us in. But positive emotions like joy broaden our focus out. They enable us to learn, to play, to grow, to connect, to try new things. And I think one of the most interesting measures of this is that entrepreneurs, when they display more joy in their pitch, receive more funding. New study out just, just recently about that. Joy also strengthens our relationships. So when we celebrate something, when we celebrate a moment of joy with um, a, a loved one, research shows that that increases the trust, the sense of intimacy, the sense of connection and closeness, and our overall satisfaction with that relationship. And joy also makes us more resilient. So we evolved to have a kind of natural stress cycle that goes like this, right? We encounter something that's stressful to us, maybe a lion, that's what our ancestors would have possibly encountered, and we have this reaction, right? Our cortisol fires, our adrenaline fires, our heart starts pumping, and we start to you know, rise to that occasion. But what's happened, I think, for a lot of us is that we live in a state of chronic stress, right? We feel like we've got a lion coming at us all the time every time we open our email. And so we live in this state of chronic stress and our bodies never get to reset. And that's not how we're wired, right? So little moments of joy, research shows that little moments of joy can reset that stress cycle. That can, they can actually reset our cardiovascular system and help protect our hearts over the long haul and actually enable us to be more emotionally resilient over time. So I think in a pretty meaningful way, when we focus on happiness, it often takes us away from joy, right? We, in pursuit of the promotion, we end up foregoing time with our family and friends. In pursuit of you know, saving up for that down payment for the house that's supposed to make us really happy, we don't make time for our hobbies. But when we focus on joy, these little moments of joy, happiness finds us. Now, 
I didn't know any of this when I first started studying joy. And of course, I didn't actually set out to study joy at all. I'm a designer. Um, and it was in my first year of design school, not far from here, at Pratt Institute, um, when a professor made an offhand comment. He said, your work gives me a feeling of joy. And not from material things, like the things I was designing. Um, I think I'd been taught to believe that those things were supposed to be superficial. And joy was much more lofty. So I asked the professors, um, how do things make us feel joy? How do tangible things give us this intangible feeling of joy? And they couldn't answer the question. And so this launched a journey, one that I didn't know at the time would take me 10 years to understand how the physical world relates to this mysterious, quixotic emotion that we call joy. And what I discovered is that not only are they linked, but that the physical world can actually be a powerful resource to us in cultivating happier and healthier lives. So when I first started out, I really wanted to answer this question first. Where does joy come from? And I started asking people I knew and even people I just met on the street about the things and places that brought them joy. And right away, I noticed a pattern. I noticed that certain things started to come up again and again and again. And they were things like cherry blossoms and bubbles, swimming pools and tree houses hot air balloons, and googly eyes, and rainbows, and rainbow sprinkles. There's something about these things that cuts across lines of age and gender and ethnicity. They're not joyful for just a few people. They're joyful for nearly everyone. They're universally joyful. And seeing them all together, it gave me this indescribably hopeful feeling. The sharply divided, politically polarized world we live in sometimes has the effect of making our differences seem so stark as to be insurmountable. And yet underneath it all, there's a part of each of us that finds joy in the same things. And though we're often told to dismiss these things as just passing pleasures, in fact, they're really important because they remind us of the shared humanity that we find in our common experience of the physical world. But I still needed to know what was it about these things that made them so joyful. I had pictures of them pinned up on my studio wall, and every day I would come in and look at them and try to make sense of it. And then one day, something just clicked. I saw all these patterns, round things, pops of bright color, symmetrical shapes and repeating patterns a sense of abundance and multiplicity, a feeling of lightness or elevation. When I looked at it this way, I realized that, yes, the feeling of joy is mysterious and elusive, but we can access it through tangible physical attributes, or what designers call aesthetics, a word that comes from the same root as the Greek asthenome, which means I feel, I sense, I perceive. What these patterns were telling me is that joy begins with the senses. And so I started calling them aesthetics of joy, the sensations of joy. And I gave them names that related to the kind of joy that they seemed to elicit. And I started to notice more of them, like freedom, the joy we find in nature and wildness and open space. Magic, the joy we find in things we can't quite pin down, like light shattered into a rainbow through a prism. Surprise, the aesthetic of contrast and the unexpected. Celebration, the joy we find in a moment of intense revelry, where it feels like the joy is so intense it's going to burst out of our bodies. It's the same thing we see when happy dancing, where our arms go up, right? And the same thing when our team wins, arms go up, our bodies expand. And we often see expanding shapes in moments of celebration. And renewal, the aesthetic of blossoming and growth and potential. All in all, I identified 10 of these aesthetics of joy. And this became kind of like a palette or a field guide. Each one of these is a trigger that connects the physical world to the emotional one inside of us. 
Um, and in the wake of this discovery, I noticed something, that as I walked around, I began spotting little <laughs> moments of joy everywhere I went. It was like I had a secret decoder ring for joy, and now that I knew what it looked like, I was seeing it everywhere. I started calling it joy spotting, and I put a hashtag on it, um, because that's what you do, and invited other people to do it with me, and I found that people were doing it at, you know, on their, walking their dog, on their commute, um, while taking their kids to school. And it became a kind of shared mindfulness practice, a way to tune your attention to the joy that you find in your surroundings, to know that anywhere you are, you can actually open your eyes and find something that can lift your own spirits. And at the same time, I noticed something else. That if these are the things that bring us joy, why are they so missing from so many places in our world? Why do we go to work here? Why do we send our kids to schools that look like this? Why do our cities look like this? And this is most extreme for the places that house the people who are most vulnerable in our society, nursing homes, hospitals, homeless shelters, housing projects. How did we end up in a world that looks like this? We all start out joyful, but as we get older, being colorful, being exuberant, these things open us up to judgment. When adults exhibit their joy, they're often dismissed as childish or superficial or too feminine or self-indulgent. And so we start to hold ourselves back from joy. We separate work from play. We feel like we have to dress and act our age. And I think it's really important to realize that this is a deep cultural bias. This is not something that you know, just a few of us feel. This is baked into our culture. So in 1810, Goethe wrote in his Theory of Colors that savage nations, uneducated people, and children typically prefer vivid color, whereas people of refinement avoid it. So he's setting up an equation there, right? That to express joy in one of the most visible ways is to be juvenile, is to be ignorant, primitive. And then Adolf Loos, writing at the beginning of the modernist movement, um, he basically equates ornament and he says, freedom from ornament is a sign of spiritual strength. So he's equating the embellishment that is a part of so many different craft traditions. Um, and he's saying that that is a kind of moral looseness, right? Um, so he's setting up a moral equation. And so it's no wonder that we have banished joy to the edges of our world. We've pushed it out to amusement parks and beaches and playgrounds and nature preserves and maybe hotels and resorts and everywhere else was left to languish. So this got me thinking, if the aesthetics of joy can be used to find more joy in the world around us, couldn't they also be used to create more joy? And so I started finding people who were doing this, like a mayor of a city in Eastern Europe called Tirana, the capital of Albania, who was elected in the year 2000. Albania was the poorest country in Europe and Tirana had been devastated by organized crime and corruption. The treasury was so bankrupt that uh, he couldn't even afford to have the garbage collected, so garbage just piled in the streets. And he started painting these vibrant designs on the downtown buildings. And right away he found that people stopped littering in the streets, that the shopkeepers started to remove the metal grates from their windows, saying that the streets felt safer, even though there were no more police on the streets than before. And then people began paying their municipal taxes. And five years after this painting project began, the number of businesses in Toronto had tripled, and the tax revenue had increased by a factor of six. So that was one example. But then I started to find people doing this much closer to home. Uh, so, for example, these schools transformed by the nonprofit Public Color, which is based right here in New York City. They go into underserved uh, New York City school districts and they transform the schools with vibrant color. And what they hear from principals is that graffiti disappears, that attendance improves, and the kids say they feel safer in these painted buildings. And this squares with research conducted in four different countries, which shows that people working in more colorful work environments are more alert, more confident and friendly than those working in drab spaces. So though the color is just on the surface, it has effects that go much deeper. Why would this be the case? 
As I started to trace back our love of color, I found that some researchers see a connection to our evolution. Color, in a very primal way, is a sign of energy, a sign of life. And the same is true of our love of abundance. We evolved in a world where scarcity was dangerous. And so abundance meant survival, which is why one confetto, which is the singular of confetti, isn't very joyful, right? You just pick it off your shoe. But multiply it, and you have a handful of one of the most joyful substances on Earth. You can see this in the work of the architect Emmanuel Moreau. Um, this is a nursing home she designed. And um, this is the room where residents visit with their families. And what the staff told me is that uh, families actually spend more time visiting with their relatives uh, since this room was redesigned. And what about all those round things I noticed? Well, it turns out neuroscientists have studied this. They placed people into fMRI machines and they showed them pictures of angular objects and round ones. And what they found is that part of the brain called the amygdala associated with fear and anxiety lights up when people look at angular objects, but not when they look at the round ones. They speculate that because sharp angles in nature were often dangerous to us, we evolved an unconscious sense of caution around these shapes, whereas curves set us at ease. And you can see this in action in the newly redesigned Sandy Hook Elementary School building. So after the mass shooting in Newtown, Connecticut in 2012, the town decided to uh, tear down the building entirely, and the architects, Fagals plus partners, were hired to build a new one. And they knew that they wanted the building to feel secure, but they also wanted it to feel joyful. So they filled it with curves. There are waves running the length of the building, squiggly canopies over the entryways, and the whole building actually bends toward the entrance in a welcoming gesture. And while you know that's a, a big and poignant example, these these aesthetics can actually influence us in very small ways as well. Um, so for example, logos. Research shows that when companies have round logos, it affects the customer service perception, that we actually believe that a company is going to be more responsive to our needs um, and uh, more likely to support us uh, when a company has a round logo versus an angular one. So small details can actually still have these effects. So I think the takeaway is that joy isn't just something we have to find. It's also something we can create. Um, and I think, for me, I find this really comforting um, because, and, and I think for a brand, I think it's a very achievable thing to think about because I think happiness is big and abstract and hard to promise. But one more moment of joy in someone's day is a very honest and I think a very, um, very generous promise to make someone. Um, so how do we do this? I mean, I think one of the ways to start is to think about this actually as a palette and, and, um, and start to think about, you know, what types of joy are inherent in your brand, in your product, in, your, in the things that you offer, and how do you dial those elements up? I'm not going to go through each one of those today, but what I do want to do in case, you know, this is something you can go deeper into. I have lots of free resources on my site and, and a book. Um, but if you wanted to start right now and you didn't want to go into all the detail, I wanted to give you three ways to start. Um, so the first is um, this idea that moments become memories. So I think when we often think about experiences and creating experiences for people, we think about trying to make them more seamless. We think about the experience as a whole. I saw this a lot with my IDEO clients, right? We try to reduce the friction, um, take you know, inconvenience out of the process, make it as effortless and seamless as possible. But that's not the way that we end up remembering things. So we measure our lives in days, but we remember our lives in moments. It's the little moments that stand out. And so I'd encourage you to actually, um, while it's important to you know, focus on streamlining a journey, it's also important to make certain moments stand out. And there's research that shows that there are three moments in particular that stand out. Um, the peak of the emotional experience, the emotional high of a journey is gonna stand out to people. The end of a journey, the last moment that they have contact with you is gonna stand out. And the unexpected moment, the thing that they didn't see coming. And I wanna give you a, an example of this um, from a friend of mine who recently took his family to London. Um, and uh, I had dinner with this couple recently and they were telling us all about this trip and they had a, you know they ate in some good restaurants and they had a nice time but there was one moment that they could not stop talking about um, so to set the stage you are um, 
you're on a plane, you're on a long haul journey, you're waking up um, after you know, a, sh a very short sleep um, on your hop over the pond and this is what you see. So this is Norwegian Airlines Dreamliner 787 experience and they have a rainbow light show when you're waking up. They also use the cabin lighting to, uh, to try to fight jet lag. Um, but this is what you see when you go to sleep and when you wake up. And this was the thing that they, my friends and their kids, could not stop talking about. Probably because it was so unexpected, right? No one thinks the plane is going to be the best part of your international journey. Um, and this can be really small. So, um, you know, if you think about the post, post, postage experience, there are many more efficient ways to ship something. But the stamp has remained this little joyful moment in the post office journey. These are actually scratch and sniff stamps. I don't know if anyone saw these. But this was like a really joyful thing that the post office has made, remained committed to, despite being a very large and bureaucratic organization. Um, here's a digital example. Um, this is Chatley, a, a company that focuses, that creates temporary tattoos. Um, and I think this is often the thing that you're closing the quickest, right, is this email, sign up for my newsletter, pop up. Um, but here it's something to savor because it has this little moment of confetti that, that brings joy. Um, and another example, this is Bando. This is their e-commerce site. Um, and the type is just like a little movement of the type that creates this little joyful bounce. And then when you roll over the shopping bag, um, it winks at you. Uh, so there are just like little touches um, that make shopping on that site a little bit more memorable. The second is to make the mundane magical. So I think we're having, we're experiencing a crisis of wonder in adult life and in modern life. And part of it has to do with the rate of change of technology around us. Things are changing so fast that even though things seem incredibly magical if we sort of step back 10 years ago, they seem very mundane um, now. And so finding ways to make little moments of people's lives a little bit more magical, remind them of the magic of it, I think is really powerful. Um, this is an example from Casper. This is their new sleep light. And I think um, one of the ways that they heighten the magic is by the setting, putting it in an extremely quotidian setting. The more that we juxtapose the magic with the sort of mundane realities of every day, the more magical these things, these devices feel. Um, and then this is uh, another example. This is Blue Land. Um, this is a company that makes um, refillable uh, cleaning products. So you buy the bottle and these little effervescent tablets and you make your own cleaning supplies. It's sort of an eco-friendly model um, for cleaning supplies. And what I think is really interesting about this is so you drop the tablet in, there's the magic of watching it change color, watching it fizz. Um, so there's like a little childhood magic in this. But what's really interesting to me about this is um, they're making you do more work. Right? They just offloaded a whole bunch of work onto you because you now have to make your own cleaning products. You don't get to buy them ready-made from the store. So this is less convenient. But something can be less convenient and more magical at the same time. And then the last point is to help people unlock their most joyful selves. So I think we often think that we have to manufacture joy. And that's a lot of pressure to think that we have to create experiences out of thin air. But if we recognize that, as I said before, we all have this joyful self within us, we all were born joyful, and that impulse is still inside of us, then what you are doing is actually trying to let that out. You're creating ways to let that out. Um, and so I think it's, it's worth just talking very briefly about the three barriers that I've noticed in my work to finding joy in daily life. First is awareness. We don't find it very often, so we forget how. Um, and we forget what brings us joy. Uh, the second is time and space. We have pressured busy lives and we don't make time or space for joy in our lives. We don't feel entitled to make that time or space. Um, and permission. Uh, we feel like being joyful or you know, expressing our joy is self-indulgent. Um, and so we don't feel permission, we don't feel entitled to do it. And I think some, you know, a brand that does this really well, that addresses all these barriers really well is Target. Um, so if you look at their product, um, it's always uh, you know, about sort of giving people more awareness of the things that could bring them joy. Um, 
feeding them little ideas. Every time you go into the store, you leave with something you didn't think you needed, right? Um, because they're all these little ideas for things that might bring you joy. Um, the second is the store, right? Time and space. They create a space. When you are going to Target, whether online or in the store, you know that you're going to, um, to, to experience joy. It creates a, a boundary around it. Um, and their communications. Uh, every touch point of communications tells you that joy is legitimate. It's welcome here. You're allowed to be joyful in this space. Um, so I think we often think of joy as extraneous. And what I'd like us to do is start to move it back to what it evolved to be, which is essential. Um, I want to share one final story, which is um, a custom that I discovered while I was researching my book, Joyful. Um, and it is a custom practiced by the Diné Native American peoples, also known as the Navajo. And they celebrate a baby's first laugh. So the first time that a baby laughs in its life is an occasion for a big party. The person who made the baby laugh has to co-host the party with the baby. Um, and they, <laughs> together, they hand out gifts for people. And it's a huge occasion of celebration in the community. But there's a deeper meaning behind this for the Diné people. Because the Diné people believe that this is the moment. The moment the baby laughs is the moment when the spirit of that baby has committed to the human form, that they've committed to this life on Earth, right? Up until that point, they're still deciding about whether they want to be along for this up and down ride. But the moment that they laugh, they're here. And to me, that's really powerful, this idea that it's laughter, it's joy that makes us fully human. Deep within us, we all have this impulse to seek out joy in our surroundings, and we have it for a reason. Joy isn't some superfluous extra. It's directly connected to our fundamental instinct for survival. On the most basic level, the drive toward joy is the drive toward life. So you can find um, much more um, from me here. Um, you can uh, find free resources that I am happy to share. And I would just love if you take this forward in any way to hear from you on how you do it. Thank you so much.